Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Icon Cameras, and Nikon. Thanks for joining me today on Midwest Whitetail. On today's episode, we're going to cover a couple of things. We're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, uh, the fishing trip that Drew and I had up into the Quetico Park last week. And that was a lot of fun, a lot of action. And uh, I'll kind of walk you through and narrate that real quick. The main part of the episode is going to be about how we film our hunts. We get a lot of questions from viewers, a surprising amount of questions from people wanting to know exactly how we set up. Uh, what camera gear we use, you know, we talked a little bit about that last week, or Aaron did, uh, while I was gone. But we're going to get into a little bit more about the setup and the types of shots we like to get and how you can tell a story of your hunt uh, just using the footage from your camera. And that's how I originally got into filming hunts in the first place. Uh, it wasn't because I, I wanted to do this for a living. It's because there were certain bucks that I was hunting and, and you only get just that little moment, sometimes a few moments where you see that deer during a season. And if you're lucky enough to kill him, that's a different story. You know, you've got the kill photo and the deer on the wall. But if you don't get him, if he just passes at the far end of the field, or whatever the case may be, you just have that little bit of memory that can fade over time. But if you've got nice video, and you've got that whole thing built into a story, that makes a great keepsake and something you can come back to year after year and, and sort of relive that moment. We've got the Midwest Whitetail Annual Meeting coming up this weekend, so we're gonna have uh, some of this whole uh, how to film a hunt uh, aspect wrapped around the annual meeting. But uh, first I want to talk about our smallmouth fishing trip up into the Quetico. This is the Canadian side of the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters is in northern Minnesota. The Quetico Park is in uh, southern Ontario. And it's a lot more trouble uh, to get across the border than it is to hunt on, or fish on the U.S. side. So a lot of people don't make that trip. The, the, the feeling is more of an of a adventure and, and, a, and a true wilderness experience than what you might have on the American side. Uh, the U.S. side is awesome. I mean, Drew and I had some great trips up to the Boundary Waters, uh, but now I think as, as time goes on, we're going to try, try to do more wilderness stuff where, you know, if something happens to me, at least he's not going to be stuck out there and he, he can find his way back out. Uh, so the further in we go, I think the more fun we're going to have. The action was uh, better than what I expected for the fishing. We started out on one of the big deep lakes and just trolling deep diving crankbaits. And I, I, we didn't spend more than an hour uh, trolling these crankbaits and caught four nice lake trout. And then uh, from there, it was almost all smallmouth bass and northern pike fishing. I'm sure we must have caught at least 100 smallmouth, and I bet you we caught 50 to 60 of them between three and five pounds, with the bulk of them being between three and four pounds, and just a few of them that topped out more than that. Uh, we caught the spawn in a couple of lakes. It was, a, it was an exciting way to fish. We just cruised along the shoreline and the water is so clear, even down to 10 or 12 feet or deeper, you can see these little fanned out areas down in the sand, or not down in the rocks and the gravel uh, where the smallmouth have made these spawning beds. Usually you can see the fish on them, but on this particular lake, most of the beds had fish. So we were just starting to cast the beds by the end. We weren't even trying to determine whether there was even fish on them. We just assumed that there would be. But uh, it, it was a lot of fun. You'd cast and just reel the jig real slow, the little, uh, I guess it was like a, a tube bait, like a little crawfish that we used right through the bed. And they would grab it to move it out and you'd set the hook and you know, we fought them fast and put them back in the water quick. Uh, so they were right back on their beds literally within you know, 30 seconds of when we set the hook. So it wasn't, wasn't like we were impacting their spawning. It was just a really fun way to, to hunt down and then catch these smallmouth. Uh, so that was really cool. The, the majority of our fishing though was just fishing back into bays and casting into shallow areas and uh, you know just reeling the little spinner uh, type jigs, maybe a Mr. Twister style, uh, 
we, we, we caught some really nice pike that way too. The biggest one we didn't get any pictures of or any video. Uh, I hooked one that was somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds on a little six pound test in one of these small Mr. Twister type rigs. And uh, I was holding him out of the water, getting ready to hand my camera to Drew to get a picture and he slipped out of my hand uh, back into the water and got away. So we didn't get any pictures of him for you. But the, the point of it is this is a great adventure and a great way to spend quality time with either friends or family. And I heartily recommend this type of trip, whether it's um, you know the Boundary Waters or the Quetico Park, or there's lots of other uh, uh, similar wilderness environments where you can get away. And it sort of goes along with this whole Cabela's Disconnect Day campaign that they're pushing right now. And that's the importance of getting away from all of your devices, you know, leaving everything behind and sort of reconnecting with nature. And uh, in this day and age, there's a lot of uh, uh, nice things or, or, or good healthy aspects to getting back outdoors and getting away from all the pressure and all the information that comes at us all the time. So take advantage of that. Um, real quick sidebar, we did test uh, some Cabela's products on this trip and the most noteworthy one was the, uh, the portage bags that we used. And these were the Cabela's Boundary Water bags and they were perfect for our trip because we had three days of rain. And, Anything you've got, if, if you're out there in the rain for three days, it's going to get wet unless it's inside something that's 100% waterproof. So even just a regular backpack and you put all your clothes in plastic bags, you're still going to wind up with half of your gear wet by the end of the day. But with these Boundary Waters bags, it was perfect. We didn't have to worry about anything. Uh, we put them in the canoe. They were easy to carry. We, you know, low center of gravity, laid them in the bottom of the canoe, tied them in place. You know, even if we'd have flipped the canoe over out in the middle of a lake, these things would have floated because you know, they're completely airtight as well as waterproof. So, uh, uh, it, like I said, it was, it was a great product and uh, one that I'd recommend for this type of a trip. Okay, uh, got that covered. Uh, now let's dig into the aspect of filming hunts. And there's a lot of ground we can cover here. Uh, I'm sure we could do 10 episodes about this and, and not hit everything. So I'm just gonna touch on the high points and uh, I'll refer you to the website. We do have on the other videos section of the player some stuff that we've put in there about filming hunts. And there's, I don't know, three or four uh, pretty informative segments that the guys in the office have put together that talk about uh, the different types of shots that you need and, and uh, how to set those up. So take a look at those. Uh, most important of, of the, the different aspects of a, of, of a piece of footage that we look for is it needs to be in focus. Uh, so we use manual focus on all of our hunts. Because if you've seen hunts that were done using uh, autofocus, you can get a lot of kind of, you know, in and out of focus action. And then you'll get the camera will snap to a branch, you know, while the deer is walking on the backside of some brush or something, and then it snaps back to the deer. It's really annoying. So learn to run the camera on manual focus. And that way you're always in control. You can keep the focus on the, on the deer even when it's walking behind something. Uh, so being in focus is important. Uh, having the shot framed up nice. And that includes not only where the deer is in the image. I mean, most people want to put it right in the middle and that's okay. The only downside is that if the deer moves forward then you're always lurching to try to keep up. So we tend to like to position the deer toward the back of the frame just a little bit. So how you frame up the animal is important. The other thing is, you know, we don't like a lot of zooming in and out. You know, once you get, you know, a, a nice looking uh, composition, just stay with that for a while. You know, don't do a lot of zooming because, you know, we tend to get excited and we like to zoom in and look at the antlers and zoom back out. The problem is the whole time you're doing that when you watch it back later again, it's just distracting and annoying. Uh, it might have been fun while you were in the stand, but it doesn't do anything for the quality of the video later. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, being steady is super important and we use the muddy camera arms in the tree and we always use tripods when we're on the ground in a blind or up in a redneck blind, uh, something like that. We never handhold cameras. So use, use tripods on the ground or in the blind and use camera arms in the tree and uh, you get a lot higher quality footage. So how you set up in the tree is going to really help, <clears throat> is really going to help you to get good footage. Uh, we like to have a little bit over the shoulder, but I don't like to be way above the hunter. If I'm filming somebody else, for example, or if they're filming me, I'd rather have the camera a little bit closer to eye level 
so you get a little bit more of a connection uh, with the hunter. Uh, so you want to set the, the stands at maybe about a 45 to 90 degree angle from each other. So that way you've got the camera between generally and you can, you know, the, the cameraman can sort of run everything with the hunter in front and they can go around the hunter if they need to. In some cases if the hunter is shooting to his or her left they might have to sit down to shoot and then film, you know, up over the top. Um, so that there's, there's a few considerations there. Um, if you're filming, just self-filming, then it's not nearly as important, but there's a lot of other challenges that come with that. We've got experts that do a very, very good job of this. Uh, Jared, Jared Mills is one example. We've got a few others that, that, that pull it off, but by and large, uh, self-filmed hunts don't really turn out that well. In order to have the deer in the frame, most people pull way back. So they've got just this little brown dot out there. You know, and you see the guy draw and shoot, and you maybe see the arrow for a little ways, and you hear the thump, and the little brown dot runs off, but you don't get the full sense of, of the excitement of the hunt. One subject that comes up a lot, too, is what camera gear uh, to purchase, and I, I think I get that question probably as much as anything else in the Ask Winky segment of the website, and that is, what is a low-budget, entry-level, decent-quality camera to purchase? And I know the guys touched on that a little bit last week when they were doing the behind-the-scenes episode, but I'm going to dive in just a little bit more. Uh, the one that, that we've used quite a lot up until this past year was the Canon G30. And uh, that one is a 20x zoom, does fairly well in, in most light conditions. It's a little bit rough in, in low light uh, compared to some of the bigger, uh, more expensive cameras. But you're always going to run into that. Really what, what you pay for in cameras for, white tail, for filming whitetail hunts is the quality of the footage in low light. Most high-end consumer cameras will do a nice enough job when the light is good that you'll be satisfied with it and some of it might even be TV quality but you start getting into those low light situations that's when you start to see those more expensive cameras really you know rise to the surface okay so the Canon G30 is a good quality choice uh, the Sony the PXW X70 is kind of the one that we've gravitated to now and both of these cameras I think the G30 is in the $1,500 range, um, and, and the X70 is in the $2,000 range, I think. Maybe a little bit more than that. Audio is just as important as the video, so there's a couple routes you can go there. Uh, the onboard audio on these little small cameras typically isn't good enough, so you're gonna have to purchase some type of microphone system. Uh, nice thing about the Canon is uh, Canon makes a nice little microphone that you can clip on there that's a stereo mic. And I think that's the DM100 or something like that. It's a little stereo mic. You'll have to look it up on Google and, and, uh, and figure out which one it is. But I think that's, that's the mic we use with those little cameras. Uh, on the X70, we actually use a wireless mic set up on that. And we use a little shotgun mic, just a little small, like six or seven inch long shotgun mic and then a, a wireless setup. So we get real high-end uh, professional quality audio out of that little X70. Uh, so something to consider, you know, you're, you're only halfway there when you consider the video. Uh, you also have to keep in mind the audio. So the final aspect of creating this memory is uh, being able to download the footage onto your computer and edit it into something that, uh, you know, looks like a deer hunt. And you can spend a lot of money on software, and we've got some pretty high-end software that we use at Midwest Whitetail. But we're also making money at this, uh, so it makes sense to invest in some of that. If you're just doing it as a hobby, you want to try to stay as inexpensive as you possibly can. And there's some fairly low-end, uh, price-wise, editing software that does a decent job. Uh, Pinnacle Studio is an example. You know, I think you can get that for a little over 100 bucks now. Uh, pretty inexpensive. It'll handle most video formats, but you might run into some formats that it doesn't want to. You know, work with very well so you might have to buy a conversion software or download some conversion software off the web and change that uh, the footage that you've got the format into something that Pinnacle likes better. Another one that people use a lot is Sony Vegas and that's not a real expensive piece of software either but it does a really nice job it's got a lot of features I'd say it's probably the next step up from the Pinnacle Studio and it's going to be you know a few steps below the stuff that we're using. I mean, we use uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, After Effects, Photoshop, uh, and, and, a, and a couple other in the uh, Adobe suite that all kind of work together and interface and, and uh, um, you know that helps us to create our, our videos quick and, and kind of seamlessly. But uh, that's pretty much all you need 
and uh, you can be running and gunning and shooting you know, deer, hunt, deer hunting videos and sharing them with your friends and there's nothing to stop you from having a little website. It's fairly inexpensive to create a website. You can upload your video to that and you can you know, to tell all your friends to go check it out. And next thing you know, you might have the next Midwest Whitetail and you'll be stealing our sponsors. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Makes my life even harder. Um, but anyway, that's, that's gonna be it for today's episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed some of the cutaways from the annual meeting. I, I hope we were able to work some of those in here and, and uh, learn something about how we film hunts and uh, some of the things that you can do yourself at home. And maybe I've got you fired up about doing some smallmouth fishing up north too. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.